So guys, let's begin with the fascia lata and its modification. The deep fascia of the thigh is named given to the fascia lata. Now this fascia lata, the very thick deep fascia of the thigh is not only just uh, sleeving the muscles around it, it is also sending some extensions inside and we do have certain openings as well, which are having an immense importance. So when I say fascia lata, that means as a deep fascia of the thigh, And it is a deep fascia of the thigh only. It is not extending into the leg. It's less of deep fascia of the thigh. The modification of the deep fascia, the modifications of this fascia lata, the certain modifications like one of them is the intermuscular septum. That is the intermuscular septum. The second modification here would be the saphenous opening. We got the saphenous opening. We'll talk about all of them. And the third modification is the, the iliotibial tract. The iliotibial tract, probably the most important out of all. Iliotibial tract or iliotibial band, we can call it. Iliotibial tract or iliotibial band. We call it IT band or IT tract. Let's talk about all of them one by one. So when I say intermuscular septum, the first modification now, let us imagine you're looking at a transverse section of a thigh. If this is a transverse section of thigh, obviously the section will go through the femur bone. So there we have femur. <coughs> and the posterior border of the femur is having this a very uh, prominent border, which we call as linea aspera. This is discussed in the osteology part in detail also, that if you look at the femur bone, the posterior border of the femur is what you call as a linea aspera. And guys, this linea aspera is providing attachment or insertion, attachment I should say in fact, to the three intermuscular septum extending from fascia lata only. Now this is fascia lata, let's say this black line here represents the fascia lata. So we have extensions and all these extensions are coming ultimately to what only? To the linea aspera, to the posterior border of the femur. And these intermuscular septum, if I just write in short only, that is intermuscular septum is dividing the thigh now into three compartments. You can see this one here is the anterior compartment. <clears throat> let's say there's a medial compartment this here is a posterior compartment we all know that thigh is having three compartments that's how they are divided by the intermuscular septum which is the modification of fascia lata now obviously every compartment is having its own muscle nerve supply and blood supply but there are certain structures that you will see extending from one compartment to another and that's why they are like considered in both a muscle which is you will see present in the anterior compartment as well as medial compartment piercing this septum, intermuscular septum. This muscle here is the pectineus. That's the pectineus muscle. Similarly, the muscle which is present in the medial compartment and posterior compartment. This mainly is a medial compartment muscle, but it this extends to the posterior compartment also. We call it the adductor magnus. That muscle is erector magnus. So this is a good, uh, could be a good question to be asked from here that pectineus muscle and erector magnus muscle, because they're extending beyond one compartment, they're piercing the intermuscular septum. So these being a two compartment muscle, they're also supplied by the nerve of both the compartments. And that's why these are the hybrid muscles also. Although we'll discuss these muscle in more detail in a while, but to tell you that pectineus muscle is supplied by two nerves. One is the nerve of anterior compartment. Now, what is the nerve of anterior compartment? Femoral nerve. And it is also supplied by the nerve of medial compartment, that is the obturator nerve. F-N-O-N. Femoral nerve, obturator nerve. Similarly, erector magnus is again supplied by obturator nerve, which is in the medial compartment. And it is also supplied by the sciatic nerve, which is the nerve of posterior compartment. More precisely, the tibial component of sciatic nerve, you can say. Or simply sciatic nerve is supplying this. So that tells you that these muscles are going beyond one compartment and they are regarded as the hybrid muscles. We talk about hybrid muscles in the general anatomy. This is what you can see here in the thigh. So that is one modification, the intermuscular septum. Second modification of the facial lata we'll talk about is the saphenous opening. Saphenous opening. As the name suggests, the saphenous opening, obviously it is for the saphenous vein, the great saphenous vein. 
now where the saphenous opening is present it is a basically opening in the fascia lata itself so if if let's say here this is the uh, let's presume you're looking at the anterior compartment of thigh so you'll have a inguinal ligament present something like this and this here is the pubic tubercle just for the reference sake this let's say is the pubic tubercle Now, 3 to 4 centimeter below and lateral to pubic tubercle. 3 to 4 centimeter. Let's go with the 4 here. So, almost 3 to 4 centimeter below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. If this distance here is like 3 to 4 centimeter. Clearly, it is below and lateral. We are going below and toward the lateral side. This is where you have this opening called as a saphenous opening. Now, this saphenous opening is having a lateral margin which is crescentric. It's a sharp. It's more superficial also. The lateral margin of the saphenous opening is more superficial. The medial margin, this one, the medial margin is more deeply placed. So, lateral margin is sharp and laterally placed and this is also called as a falciform margin. This is called as the falciform margin of the saphenous opening. The lateral margin is a the crescentric or falciform margin and not only this this saphenous opening is covered with a fascia like a sieve like fascia that is called as the cribriform fascia so the one which is covering it that is called as a fascia that is a cribriform fascia so you can say even cribriform cribriform fascia is also a modification of fascia lata only it's basically a sieve like fascia which allows the structures to go in and come out just like we have a cribriform plate in the anterior cranial fossa this here is called as a cribriform fascia which is like uh, bridging or covering this saphenous opening and what this saphenous opening is allowing guys this saphenous opening is obviously giving passage to the great saphenous vein and its tributaries so it is giving passage to the to the great saphenous vein And also give passage to the certain lymphatics, the lymphatics which has to go from the superficial to and drain into the deeper group of lymph node. So they can also go through the, the saphenous opening. So the structures through the saphenous opening will be the great saphenous vein, the tributaries, and you can also see some lymphatics going through it. So there is a second modification of the facial lata. What? That is saphenous opening present 3 to 4 centimeter below and lateral to pubic tubercle. That's a landmark here. That's a surface marking for this. <clears throat> Covered with a cribriform fascia. The lateral margin is more crescentric, it is like a, a moon shape, so we call it a falciform margin here. And medial margin is the one which is more deeply placed. So lateral margin is superficial, medial margin is more deep. And you can see this medial margin is basically present deep to the great saphenous vein only. So great saphenous vein goes inside and drains into the femoral vein through the same saphenous opening. That was the second modification. Coming to the third and definitely the most important, the third modification of the facial lata and that is the iliotibial tract. The iliotibial tract or iliotibial band, as you can call it. Iliotibial tract or iliotibial band. Now, look at the name. What the name suggests is, guys, iliotibial. That means it is starting somewhere from the iliac bone and it is going all the way to the tibia. So, that means there is no attachment on femur. It is all about attachment on the iliac bone and to the femur. Now, once again, you will see that in the osteology part that iliac bone having this iliac crest and there is a tubercle of the iliac crest present on the lateral side. Let me try to uh, try to draw it for you. Let us say you are looking at a, this is a hip bone here and you are looking at the lateral side of the hip bone. And let's presume this here is the iliac crest. So, you will see that there is a tubercle like this in the iliac crest. This, this crest here is a iliac crest, iliac bone you are looking at and that's a tubercle of the iliac crest. So, this basically is a view from the lateral side, basically looking at it from the lateral side. So, this iliotibial band or iliotibial tract is having one band attached to this tubercle of the iliac crest like this. That's more superior band or more superficial also. And the deeper band will be attached to the capsule of the hip joint. Not drawing that part. So, deeper band will be to the capsule of the hip joint. So, it's more like a Y-shaped in the upper part. And then what you'll see that then it extends downward laterally it extends downward laterally and it goes all the way till the lateral tibial condyle. 
if this here is a tibia bone let's say so it is going toward the lateral tibial condyle let me just draw fibula here for this for the reference let me mark these attachment guys this iliotibial band one band you can see it is attached to what it is attached to the tubercle tubercle of what tubercle of the iliac crest one thing the second band the deeper band as you can see it is attached to the capsule of the hip joint it is attached to the capsule of the hip joint and below it is attached to the lateral tibial condyle i don't even have to say that i'm just writing l here for the lateral lateral tibial condyle that's a lateral side this is medial side so there's a tubercle which is present on the anterior surface of lateral tibial condyle there is a tubercle present on the anterior surface of lateral tibial condyle and that tubercle is called as a girdis tubercle the tubercle here is called as a girdis tubercle and that provides attachment to this ilio tibial band so this is first thing about the attachment here above to the tubercle of iliac crest and the capsule of hip joint and below laterally it is attached to the girdis tubercle so this a very thick band present on the lateral side of thigh the importance is guys first of all it is providing insertion to some important muscles also two gluteal muscles they receive insertion on this ilio tibial band one of them is the tensor fascia lata muscle we'll be showing you these muscles in the gluteal region only so one muscle is tensor fascia lata and this also receives a major insertion of the gluteus maximus the largest muscle of the human body the gluteus maximus also inserts in there so one is what one is the tensor fascia lata tfl i'm writing tensor fascia lata and the other muscle that is the gluteus maximus so this again could be a good question to be asked that what muscles they receive are or they are inserted on the iliotibial band and that is the tensor fascia lata and gluteus maximus the muscles inserted now what clinical question is to be asked from here we say iliotibial band is uh, you know, what is the function of this band guys now you can see there is no attachment on the femur it is attached to the hip bone and below it is attached to the tibia so basically it stabilizes the tibia uh when the foot is in non weight bearing position and then the most there's a lot of muscles which are uh, you know uh, working on the knee joint so this basically helps the tibia to be stabilized on the femur so this this is the tensor fascia lata because you know gluteus maximus is used while walking and so is the tensor fascia lata so they are obviously every time when they are contracting these muscles are being pulled and this tensor fascia lata will also get taut so that way is it is directly putting the pressure on the uh, the the tibia bone below it is pulling the tibia as well and kind of stabilizing the tibia while walking clinically what is important to note here is that let's say if there is a contracture of the iliotibial tract then what will happen now like in case of poliomyelitis there could be this contracture of this tibial iliotibial band if this iliotibial band contracture will take place then obviously the patient will show some sort of modification at the hip joint as well as at the knee joint because this band is crossing both the joint you can see it is crossing the hip joint and then it is crossing the knee joint also so that again could be a good question to be asked that in case of it band i am writing itb it band iliotibial band contracture in case of iliotibial band contracture what will be the position of hip joint and what will be the position of the knee joint so if i go with the hip joint first the position of the hip joint can easily be remembered with this mnemonic that is faber f a b e r faber like faber castell wala faber this faber this f here is for the flexion the word ab is for the abduction and er will help you remember external rotation so guys your hip joint will go into the position of flexion it will also be in the position of abduction and er here is for the external rotation or you can say lateral rotation so hip joint is flexed it is kind of abducted and it is also externally rotated what would be the position of the knee joint in this iliotibial band contracture the knee joint position like again it is crossing the knee joint so what you will see it is again causing causing the flexion at the knee joint one thing then second thing what will it do it will also cause the external rotation of the tibia see the iliotibial band is attached to the lateral side of the tibial condyle so when this this uh, this band contracture takes place the 
knee will also go into flexion so they're like the knee will also go into the flexion second thing because it is pulling the tibia from the lateral side so there is a lateral rotation of the tibia also and along with the lateral rotation of tibia because the pull is coming toward the posterior side it will also pull the tibia back and can cause the posterior subluxation also so flexion external rotation of tibia external rotation of tibia and posterior subluxation of the tibia can also take place flexion external rotation and posterior subluxation if you want to remember that knee joint position again knee joint is flexed it is externally rotated what is externally rotated in the knee joint basically it's a tibia which is externally rotated and then there also is a because of this pull on the posterior side a constant pull on the posterior side will also cause the posterior subluxation of the tibia as well so this is very very important to know clinically that what will be the position of the hip joint especially the hip joint which is like more commonly asked position of the hip joint and knee joint in case of ilio tibial band contracture so guys this is a bit about the d fascia of the thigh the fascia lata and its three modifications